Amen. Thank you, choir, and all the ways that you serve and the way that you lead. So this morning, we remember uh, those in Venezuela and all the uprest in their country. And so this morning, we will be prayerful as we remember what is happening there and pray that uh, God will bring peace to them. We also remember today is uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And so our hearts go out to uh, those in the Jewish community as we remember this tragedy. Will you pray with me? Oh God, as we come together now in word, I pray that all that is heard and received by your people will bring glory only to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, several years ago when I was uh, working as a counselor at the technical college, I had a, a middle-aged man, Haitian man, come into my office and he wanted to talk about his classes. He was there to take English classes, to learn English. And um, as he sat down and he was talking to me, we were going over his classes, I just kept imagining uh, what I should say to this man because it was two days after the earthquake had hit Haiti in 2010, the massive earthquake. And I'm thinking, surely he's got more on his mind than his classes. So I just stopped him and I said, Sari Dare, I said, um, what about the earthquake? in Haiti, and his, his whole demeanor, he just sunk in his chair and he said, yeah, he said, I have four grown children in Haiti, one son who's actually a university professor, and he said, I have heard nothing. I can't, uh, I can't eat, I can't sleep, I don't know anything. And he told me that on January 15th, the actual day of the earthquake, one of his sons had called him at 1 o'clock p.m., and Sarah Dare was in class, and he said to his son, I can't talk to you right now, I'm in English class. And uh, then three hours later, the earthquake hit, and there was just no news at all. And Sarah Dare didn't say so, but I could sense that he was grieving the last words to his son, that, uh, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you right now. And I think about that tragedy and that silence that Sarah Dare was experiencing, and it made me think about today's reading uh, from Nehemiah, that the Jewish people had also experienced a tragedy in their land. And so the background to story of this uh, reading that we had today is that a generation earlier, Jerusalem had been conquered by Babylonia from the east. And in, when that happened, their beloved temple was damaged, the walls of the city were left in rubble, and most of the people were taken from their beloved homeland, and they were forced into exile. And they went to live as subjects within the Babylonian Empire. And the Jewish people believed that this was their punishment, that somehow they had sinned or disappointed God. See, the prophets had warned them that if they disobeyed God or didn't follow the laws of mercy and justice, that there would be ruin upon their land, and that God would be distant to them. And God would be silent. So here we are, today's reading is 50 years later. And finally, many of the people are allowed to return. And they go back to Jerusalem. They go back to the day that they dreamed of. While living in exile, they had turned three times a day to their beloved city, Jerusalem, and wept and prayed. And now they come home. But coming home, they face the devastation of their city and their temple. And so Nehemiah hears what's going on back home in Jerusalem, and he feels called to go. And so he goes back and he leads a major rebuilding project. They start a building fund. We know what that's like here at Suncoast. And they gave generously to that building fund. And they worked together from sun up to sundown. They carried loads of stone. They erected large beams. They rebuilt the walls and their entrances. And they put doors on the gates with bars and bolts. And after 52 days, they were done with that wall. And they were gathered inside safely. And then... What happens next is the spiritual reform. They come together 
in the square called Watergate. Not the Wick Nixon's Watergate. <laughs> Probably where they gathered water, at the Watergate. And they gather in this square with women and men and children. And Ezra, the priest, brings out the books of the law. And I wonder in my mind, how long? How long had it been? How long had they waited for this day and for this moment? You see, many of the people were illiterate. And it's speculated that previously they didn't have access to the scrolls. Maybe Ezra had brought them from Babylonia, preserved them all this time. Maybe they had found these scrolls in their damaged temple. Or maybe as subjects they simply could not practice their religious traditions. So there they gather in the water gate. And Ezra, I can just see it in my mind, taking these scrolls and unrolling them and reading. And the people stand and listen. And Ezra reads not for one hour, not for two hours, not for three, but for six long hours. They stand and they hear the ancient stories of God's care and deliverance of them and the laws that they are to follow. And given their response, I can imagine that it is as if they are hearing it for the first time. Finally, the silence is broken. Finally, after all the years of ruin, the years of living in exile, of being in fear, of seeing their broken down temple, the years of not hearing God's word, the silence is broken. And standing in the, there in the water gate, they say, Amen, Amen. And they raise their hands. And they bow to the ground. Many of us know what it is like to have those periods in our lives when we don't know if God is speaking. Or maybe we can't hear God or connect to God's word. And when we have those periods of silence, we might feel abandoned. We might feel that it's our fault, that we're to blame. Word of God speak. I love that song we sang today. Word of God speak, pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness, word of God speak. And the word of God did speak all those years ago to their hearts. And upon hearing it, the people weep. And I wonder, was it just a quiet shedding of tears? Was it an inner sobbing? Was it a loud community wailing tears of sadness tears of relief tears maybe of repentance so I asked this morning what do we do in those times when we feel a silence from God how do we hear God speak to us when we might feel so isolated well one thing I think we can do is take a retreat. Do something out of the ordinary. That's what the people, the Hebrew people did. They had been working so hard. All this back-breaking labor, rebuilding. And they said, we're just going to have a retreat today. We're going to go down to the town square, to the water gate. You know, there was a violinist in Washington, D.C. at the metro station. It was in January, so you can imagine it was cold. And this violinist played Bach for about 45 minutes. Well, after three minutes, there was this middle-aged man who stopped for a few seconds and then he kept moving along. After four minutes, the violinist received his first dollar bill from a woman who dropped it in the bucket and just kept walking. After six minutes, a man was observed leaning up against the wall, 
Then he looked at his watch and he just moved on. After about 10 minutes, there was a very young little boy who really wanted to stop and listen to this violinist, but his mother tugged him right along while the little boy just watched the violinist the whole way. And this action was repeated several other times by children who wanted to stop and their parents just quickly moved them through the metro station. During that 45 minutes when the violinist was playing, about 2,000 people went through that station. The violinist collected $32. And then when he finished, no one applauded, no one even noticed, he just packed up and left. But what no one knew was that this was an experiment. And the violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the greatest musicians of all time. And he was playing some of the most intricate pieces of music ever written on a violin that was worth $3.5 million. <laughs> and just two days before that, Joshua Bell had played in Boston at a concert where tickets averaged $100 each. The point to me of that story is that God is always speaking to us. Even when we don't hear. And so I challenge us today to find ways to stop in the busyness. Take a retreat in the midst of all the chaos of life. Secondly, when we cannot hear God speak, I encourage us to stay in community. Throughout history, God has moved most frequently through a community of people, through a group of people. As a community, in our reading today, the Jewish people traveled back home together to claim their identity. As a community, together they rebuilt their city. As a community, together they stood in that water gate and they asked to hear the word of God read together and explained to them. And individually, I doubt that any of this would ever have happened. None of them could have done this on their own. Often, when we imagine in our own lives God's silence, we might have a tendency to isolate. No one ever does that, right? We never isolate. I'm, I'm guilty myself. <laughs> but that's the worst thing we can do. God often uses other people. God uses our church to speak to us. So I encourage you, if you are struggling today or struggling in the future, stay in community. Reach out to somebody. I know for me, often, it's God's word that comes through somebody else, that God speaks through other people to me. Thirdly, when you feel a silence or a distance from God in your life, don't give up hope. Be patient. Like those people in our reading today that turn to Jerusalem three times a day, hopeful. God will never abandon you. And the, the answers that you seek will definitely come. You know, there was a lost love letter. It was postmarked in May 1945 as return to sender. And it was written to a Norwegian sailor who was serving in World War II, who never got the letter. But it was read like this. I love you, Rolf. I love you like the warm sun. This is what you are to my life the sun about which everything else revolves for me. And before signing it, Virginia wrote, are you as lonesome for me as I am for you? Doesn't that just want to make say aw? You can say aw, isn't that sweet? <laughs> are you, are you as lonesome for me as I am for you? The letter was found eventually and delivered 72 years later to Rolf Christofferson. And his wife, Virginia, who had written the letter, had died six years earlier. 
And when Rolf received this letter, it brought such tears to his life, both tears of sadness, but also tears of joy as he remembered his wife that he had had for 62 years. God writes us love letters every day. And we may not always receive it right away, or we might not always feel those words, but those words are out there. And those words are alive in the universe. And when we need to hear them, when we need them in our very hearts and souls at the right time, I think the silence will be broken. And we will come home to hear God's word for us. My student friend, Sari Dare, waited longer, five long days. He waited, and the son finally got through to him and said that all four of his children were fine. And Sari Dare was on the road to healing from that tragic experience. The silence was broken. So let us know that even though we may experience times of silence, God is always speaking to you. God is always sending you messages of love. And if you have times when it's difficult to hear, take a retreat. Step away from the busyness. Stay in community. And don't ever give up. Because God will never abandon you. Word of God, speak. Pour down like rain. God, help us to be still and know that you are in this place. And God, you're with us always. Amen.